Welcome to the Academy of Speed Sports Podcast. I am your host, James O'Hagan, and today I'm with Lori Bajork. She is the president of the National Esports Association. She is out of upstate New York, up near the Syracuse area. Is that correct? Actually, in Rochester, New York. But Rochester, yeah, sorry. Be- no, it's sorry. okay. We're right in between Syracuse and Buffalo, so right in the middle. Very good, very good. And uh, it's um, as as I as we start into the podcast here, you know, we, like I said, we were vamping for a second because we also broadcast this live out to Twitch and Facebook and well, not today and LinkedIn, but. Uh, yeah, everything all of a sudden is just exploding in front of me as as it's warning me that one of our services is not connected. So if you're trying to watch this on Facebook, guess what? You're not going to watch it on Facebook today. <laughs> um, Lori, I became uh, aware I, we, we've kind of been connected on LinkedIn for a while. And, you know, esports in the academic sense has been growing in in unique places. Uh, There has been nonprofits that have grown up across the United States. There's been for profit companies that have come up across the United States. And as COVID hit, there's been a lot of even adjustments there with regards to, um, you know, how esports is being uh, done. I saw you keynote a conference. It was the Tech and Learning uh, esports conference that they did not too long ago. I saw you keynote that. And and the production value of your introductory video was so amazing. And um, but where do you see uh, esports through the National Esports Association fitting into the landscape as it's evolving and growing right now? Well, I mean, I think you just hit the the nail on the head. It is evolving and growing and changing on a minute to minute basis. So, you know, one of the things when I took over as the president of the National Esports Association, I thought my job was going to be a, a lot different than it is. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that the landscape was a little bit more um, uh, taken care of um, and that the infrastructure was there. And as I started, you know, talking with universities and um, high schools, I started realizing, wait wait a minute, we've got to kind of go back and think about what is it that we're looking for in esports and education. Um, And everybody, you know, in my organization, we're all educators first, we're gamers second. Um, But really, truly what we're looking to do is how can we engage students online in an impactful way um, and using gamification of the classroom. So, but in order to do that, in order to really truly do what everybody is trying to do right now, um, make esports run like every other sport. Well, you can't do that until the infrastructure is there. Mm. So what we've been working diligently at since I think I've been in this job eight, a little over 18 months now um, is working on that infrastructure and really helping high schools and even elementary schools. So we started with K through 12. And then now with COVID, it's really looking at the, how is it, how is esports impacting colleges? Mm -hmm. So we've got colleges that are trying to start esports and offering scholarships, but then there's no, there's no funnel and there's no discipline to actually understand how you get there. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, so my job, literally changes on a minute to minute basis and then COVID hit. So throw everything that I was doing out the window and then March 16th happens and you're like, okay, now we got to change everything that we were doing Um, and work together um, to kind of solve this problem that we're having in the, they call it the digital gap, um, educational gap. Like it's a major problem out there right now. Um, And did I see being president of the national esports association that I would be, you know, an integral part of fixing online education so that our students have the, um, the resources that they need to be the future leaders of tomorrow. So let's back up for a second because, you know, upstate New York is not typically an area that a lot of people think about when they think about esports. Uh, you're again, you're in the Rochester area. Yep. Now it's not to say that there's not a lot of uh, how should we say STEM related schools and institutions up there? I mean, the Rochester Institute of Technology is is one of the best in the United States. You have Syracuse University not too far away. Of course, uh, Toronto, Canada is is just a hop, skip, and a jump over the border. Though it's a little bit of a it, it looks so close on a map, and then it's like it, I've driven across upstate New York. It's not small at <laughs> all, uh, and it's not New York City. Uh, I'm one of these people who my mother lived in uh, Croton. Uh, out just north of New York City, I used to call okay. that upstate upstate New York, jokingly, mm-hmm. uh, which it is not at all. But where? All right, let me back up for a second. How do you find yourself 
attracted to esports? What what in your background made you go, you know what? This is where I want to be right now. Oh, uh, that that's what we call a loaded gun question. Sure, so I love loaded gun we, questions. So I actually say I've been in esports before esports was even a word, before we even figured out how to properly spell esports and so that we all are having common ground. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if you go back um, basically 11 years um, and start with um, where my son was, he was in kindergarten at the time and he went to school and I was like, great. He was really into Legos. And I'm like, okay, tell me about your Lego program. Tell, talk to me about your STEM programs. And I'm like, we have yoga and chess. And I'm like, hmm. And I did explain to you that my son is five and um, <laughs> yeah, that's not going to work. So then kind of fast forward, I started watching his evolution and this game Minecraft came out back when it was in beta form Mm -hmm. and transferring from Legos to this three dimensional CAD program. I was like, this is amazing. And then I started watching the development of the program and started working with Minecraft education and looking at what can we do to utilize the resources for what our digitized youth has actually started using. There was nothing out there. So um, I kid, we took a, we started a Lego program. I work with Lego education. We started working with Minecraft and there was nothing out there. And the first time we had a Minecraft camp, zero kids showed up. And then- Which is hard to believe in this day and age, right? Yeah, right? So so let's fast forward. That was summer in Christmas, it came, Minecraft came out on Xbox. And then my son was like, mom, can we try again? When we were running an after school enrichment program that was really um, back in what we call, you know, STEM arts um, and really thinking outside the box and how you can actually educate students and give them enrichment programs. So we were, you know, we, we, we were doing, we still do languages, arts, music, um, Legos, whatever we could do to stimulate that mind and make organic learning fun. Mm-hmm. So we then posted for our first, uh, another Minecraft camp and we sold out in a day. Um, and now we have, a, we had over and still have over 600 kids that go through our program just here locally every year. And it just kept growing and growing and growing. And you know, when you're on the path to something, when it happens organically and you don't push it. Um, and when students are showing up at your classroom at eight o'clock in the morning, even though camp doesn't happen open till nine, the parents are like, I'm really sorry, Mrs. Bajoric, but Johnny wanted to make sure he got the right computer or Sally wanted to make sure that they got it. And then when they come to pick them up early, they're crying because mm-hmm. you came 10 minutes early, whereas before these students weren't engaged. So we knew we were on to something. And when we started developing these programs, it just evolved, as I said, what with seeing what it can do um, and how we can actually help stimulate growth and learning and keeping kids engaged because it's so hard right now. We have a digitized youth, but we're still teaching old school ways. I I find your story interesting in that uh, 10, let's see, 2010, no, 2011, sorry. So about 10 years ago, I was in a little town called Forest Mill, Illinois. Uh, it's southwest of Rockford, about 45 minutes, farm town, thousand kids in the whole school district, K-12. And they brought me there because they wanted to do a one-to-one program. Cool. One of the stipulations that I had was if I'm coming here, a couple of things, YouTube's going to be open. They're going to be able to connect through social media and uh, they're going to be able to install their own apps on the device. You know, we're not going to lock all these things down. A couple of days in. I started noticing pods of four kids sitting together on the floor or sitting outside of the school before school started. And finally, I went up to one of them and I said, what are you all doing together? Because it was weird to just see clumps of four all over the entryway. And they said, we're playing Minecraft. I go, go, what's that? And they showed it to me. I go, "Okay." And so I went back into my office because I was the tech director at the time. And I pulled up the um, I had a, a. Part of my software package that I had was I could see what apps were installed on student devices. 97% of those thousand kids had installed Minecraft yeah. on their on their, their and this wasn't Minecraft free. They had to pay for it. And it was amazing to see how 97 in just a few days, 97% of kids. So when you talk about this, when you talk about 
you know, the engagement factor around this and the grassroots factor of how Minecraft grew. And I think, do you think it has to do, what do you think really brought Minecraft into the forefront with kids? I have a guess, but I want to hear what your thoughts are. And maybe they're the same. Well, I really think they, they hit the nail on the head where they tied in a, you know, a sandbox sandbox game with something that was already such a successful um, tool, Legos. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the way that it was marketed, I have to, I have to say it was brilliant. Um, but really what, what it is, is it's an unlimited resource that you can do anything you want. And when you start that imagination and that building tool, it goes back to Legos. Why are Legos such a, a timeless toy, but so brilliant and what it can do with spatial manipulation, with dexterity, with creativity, and thinking beyond just the the, the kit that you get. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even when we were doing Lego education, Students would come in to me, you know, and ask me, where's the directions? I'm like, the directions are right here. They're in your brain. Like, you have to come up with this and and really utilize what you have and and create your own world, your own devices. And Minecraft is one of those things. It's a limitless opportunity. And we were already had youth being digitized and wanting to learn. Mm-hmm. And I think it's just that whole creativity part and using that part of the brain that we don't normally have immediate access to. It's, it's, it's like you said, when you, when you, when I discovered it, um, I was like, this game is brilliant. Just like Legos are brilliant. And I think what, what I'm hearing you say, and maybe this is just one portion of it, but I hear, and what I saw was that there's a lot more control. I think kids are crying out in school. You know, again, when I said the device was going to be open so they could install their own apps, if it had been up to me, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have put Minecraft on every iPad. I would have never have thought to put iPad uh, Minecraft on every iPad. But these kids having control over the devices, ownership of the devices and, and for people to say, well, why would you open up social media? Look, at that point, even 10 years ago, those kids had cell phones. They were connecting with people all over the world. Why put locks on doors when walls are coming down at that yeah. point? Let's let's teach them how to embrace this space. And again, seeing those clumps of kids and the reason why they were sitting in clumps and I like what you were kind of describing was it's all up here, right? It was kids taking these environments, creating in these environments and sharing them together. I mean, that that was beautiful, but of course, Lori, I'm sure somebody will say to you, that's not esports. Yeah. <laughs> It's right? true. Um, it, it's really funny when when I actually say I look at esports as any type of. It's not, it doesn't have to be competitive gaming. It has to do with how can you put a group of students together that they are a com- they are interacting towards a common goal. And when you think of sports, that's what sports is all about. It's about creating a sense of community and bringing people together so that you actually have a common goal, which could be winning. Um, It could be, but it also could be completing a build or just doing something that creates um, the whole aspect of competition. But competition can be defined in so many different ways. Um, I I think that's what what COVID, I'm I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know if you were done with your thought, but I had to jump on this. I think that's something too that COVID has, I think, I hate to say COVID has been good for this. It's been, it's nice. It would like to be, I'd like it to be good for something. And I think what it has been good for is showing us just how, how strong, especially school districts that already had esports programs going, that were doing it correctly, that weren't so hyper-focused on games and a pathway to the pros, but we're building things around community. Yeah. I think right now what we're seeing are those programs that were very well run, that those communities are so important right now. I think you just hit the nail on the head. It's a sense of community. When I go out to colleges or high schools or even elementary schools and students run up to me and they're like, could you talk to my mom? Could you, I wish I knew you five years ago. It's because they're looking for ownership, meaningfulness, being part of something that's important to them. And, you know, well, you know, Minecraft is one of those games that you can bring in people from all across the globe um, and uh, 
one of the things that we did during COVID is do a, a Minecraft Easter egg hunt where we had students from Australia, from the Czech Republic, from China, from India, all coming together in a global event. Mm-hmm. And you're, you're, you're breaking down barriers. I mean, you know, as well as I know, key buzzwords right now, inclusion, diversity, and equality. How do you get those? And how do you actually start bridging those gaps so that you actually help empower these students so that they become those future leaders, those those future ambassadors, and that they have a community that is global that they can then reach out to when they get older and start to really understand what it takes um, to to be leaders and to really change the way that we're looking at the world and how we actually are interacting. And esports, that you're, I think you hit it, the nail on the head. COVID forced us to look at how we are interacting and how we can actually still remain socially distant, but still socially connected. Mm -hmm. And and what I also um, I think is important with all this, because I think there's a perception of that there there was before all this that Mm -hmm. um, that, that the league was important that you were a part of or you know, having a, a 12 week season, quote unquote, or the titles that you offered. Again, when it comes back to community, when it comes back to experience, when it comes back to those kind of things, whether you pay for a league or whether you set one up in house and run it just whatever you're doing, or whether it's two weeks or whether it's, you know, we're changing games all the time, all that stuff that, that, that I guess pro experience. It, this it, this is the nice thing that I think diversifies us from traditional sports. Yep. Those things don't matter. It, it, it is truly, we have an opportunity to use this as a tool to meet our kids where they are. What what experience have you seen for meeting your kids uh, where they are and the importance of, of your model through the NEA? Well, I think what you just actually hit, I keep saying you hit the nail on the head, like you're doing good. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It's like I always tell when someone says that they want to start an esports program, I say you have to start locally and think globally. So look at what your community wants to do right now and start talking with your students. And a lot of them don't want to compete. That's not what they're about. It's the same thing I look at. You know, I also had some experience prior to this and I worked with junior NBA basketball. I know way too much about basketball. I know way too much about track. I understand. But. Not everybody wants to be in the NBA. Mm -hmm. Not everybody wants to be a pro gamer. But if you ask students, 90% of them are gamers at heart. They are playing a game and they're using it so that they are socially connecting with their friends. And that is the most important aspect. I said, I always say there's three types of esports. You've got your pros. You have your amateurs and then you have your fans. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think we've lacked at is how do we actually address the fans? Because those are the really the most important people because they are so they want to be part of something, but they don't want to be, you know, they're they're not going to be they're not going to go into esports as a pro career, but think about all the other things you can do with the esports and all the other doors that it opens for you that it's not just about how many eliminations did you get in Fortnite or, you know, what you built in Minecraft or, you know, what your, your, like what your score is on League of Legends or any of these games. I mean, that's just what you're using to create a social community. Um, And then what you really want to do is you want to watch the guys that are really good and the girls Mm -hmm. that are really good. Like you see people all the time watching Um, in just like any other sport. So you have to be able to really address all three of those. And and a really big part is the amateur part. Like think about what we do when you're starting to play little league baseball, right? Do you think your kid's going to make it all the way up into the, you know, to to, to play on the Yankees? (laughs) It's not the point. The point is that they're part of something. And you're helping structure it and you're helping them to to create camaraderie and and learning how to lose gracefully and win gracefully um, and understanding what it's like to be part of a team. And those are things that a lot of students, 
um, don't have that exposure because they don't have the phys- the physicality to play in it. They don't have the interest to play in it. But this just broadens that experience so that more students have that opportunity to be part of something that is important to them. So they start to develop those soft skills that I think are lacking today. I, I agree with you on that. I, growing up, was a football player. Though uh, my grandfather played for the New York Giants, my dad played at the University of Notre Dame. And let me tell you something at six foot two and about 300 pounds, guess what you're expected to do when you have that kind of background? You're expected to play football. And guess what? I hated every second of it. Oh my I hated it all. I hated getting hit. I hated practice. I liked watching football at the time. In fact, when I went to Purdue, I got a minor in coaching and actually took classes on how to coach football. That stuff fascinated me. But like you said, you know, the interest wasn't that. even with baseball. I love Sandlot baseball. I love going out. Yeah, I lobbed me the pitch. I mean, I hit it 300 feet or 400 feet or wherever, how far we hit it. But you get me into a, a, a practice situation. Oh, my gosh, I couldn't be more bored at all in, in my life. And I think the other thing you talked about with the fans, I saw this even in my first years of teaching 20 years ago when I was a fifth grade teacher. I saw kids when we had our computer club which quickly became a gaming club, would just come and hang out. Mm-hmm. They didn't, they, we were playing StarCraft. They saw the game and they're like, okay, cool. But they were more interested in just being there and watching and having fun and supporting their friends. Again, as you said, community. I think that's something, even uh, um, I talked with uh, uh, Kathy Shong, at, she's the assistant director at UCI Esports. Her start was, putting together tournaments in high school for League of Legends. And that that whole UCI esports program started because of community. Yep. I don't think that's where I think, you know, the play versus and the HSELs and and the other, you know, the EGFs and all the other leagues around, I think have really missed on. They see yep. there's a dollar amount there. They're, they're a for-profit company. But that whole community, you can't buy community. You just can't. You can't. And you can't fake it. I will tell you the one thing that, when I see students and when I go meet with them, they understand the difference between someone who genuine. how do you put this politely, someone who genuinely cares and has their interests at heart mm-hmm. and understands that what I'm trying to do is create a pathway to success and to make you feel welcome and to really break down those barriers. Like I, that's what this is about. That's what I look at. And, and, it's funny you mention that because people always compare us to what other things are doing. I'm like, I, I, I'm on my own trajectory. I have my own vision, my own my own thing because I actually have lived it with my son, mm-hmm. and I've lived it with my students over 11 years, and seen what it's like to be told like what you're you're wasting your time. Get off the computer. Oh, you that's know? the worst thing. I, yeah, I hate like, that part. And, and and people have used it to to use it as a punishment. So I'm limiting the time on your computer. I'm limiting the time that you're playing something you're passionate about. And we have, you know, we have certain sayings over here at the National Sports Association, play with a purpose. You know, like, like you have to understand, and I tell parents all the time, I'm like, have you sat down and played the game with your child, whatever game it is? Do you know how to play Minecraft? I don't even care if you're an expert at it, but do you understand? Did you just sit down and watch? <laughs> um, you know, have you played Fortnite? Did you ever try? Like, it's game night. Like, we used to, when we were kids, I mean, I'd sit around with my parents and play Yahtzee and we play life. You know, use it as a, a connection as, mm-hmm. as opposed to just a constantly, they're like, I'm... I, I run a joke that when I first started going out and doing like, you know, keynote speeches or things, people would throw tomatoes at me because parents would be like, I want to get my kid off the computer, not on mm-hmm. the computer. And I said, but what you're not doing is you use the computer as a babysitter. You didn't use it as a resource for actually getting the the response that you want from a student. When, we, when students come to my classroom, we have – how do you put it? Like I'm in control because I have something that they want and that's Mm. knowledge and experience and they want to be heard. They want to be seen. Um, And as a result of it, we all behaviors disappear and they also know it's a joke. There's a switch. Like with one switch, I can turn every computer off Mm. and you have to do that once in a classroom to understand the fact that 
you know, we're the computer gods, you know, like it, it's, it's electric how, runs the computer. But how damaging it can be to flip that switch mm-hmm. too, especially with, you know, you hear the horror, I, I will call them a horror stories of that kid who has worked for years and years and years on their realm. Let's take a Minecraft realm, right? Oh, yeah. And that parent who just goes in a fit of anger or control or psychosis or whatever it is and deletes that work. Mm. That's like taking your artwork and burning it in front of them. That's like popping the basketball. That's like, that's not taking the keys to the car. That is taking the car, taking it to the trash compactor and pushing it, you know, into a cube. There's, there's a difference between, because you even talked about, you know, that whole, you know, pushing kids away and telling them it's a waste of time. There's a difference between addiction and passion. Exactly. And I think too many people are so quick to tie it up as addiction when kids are really interested. Again, that self-determination theory, that sense of relatedness and autonomy and community. When those things are there, it really can look like addiction because guess what? That's what we've been conditioned to believe that video games, you can't be passionate about video games. It's just video games. Why would you be passionate about this? But again, it, it's it's work that you're doing, the work that we do here through the podcast and the connections we make of really trying to educate people that the medium is different. You know, people are passionate about football. They'll sit and watch. They'll go to Vegas Amen. On, on a championship weekend and sit in front of a TV and watch football for eight hours and think that's the most normal thing on the planet. If I was a social scientist from uh, Mars... I'm a, I'm a Martian social scientist, and I looked at Earth uh, on a Sunday afternoon, and I saw somebody sitting in front of a big screen for eight hours and doing nothing but watching other 12, 22 grown men push each other around at a time. I would go, that's crazy. And, scream at the, and, and be screaming at the TV, too, when it, when your team isn't winning. Yeah. Yeah, it's... I, I, I think I did a keynote once and when I think I did a keynote once and I used an example. If your child was sitting practicing the piano for three hours, would you kick him off the piano? No. You'd be like encouraging that behavior. Your son's dribbling a basketball obsessively, right? That's a behavior that we say is okay. Mm-hmm. But when your child keeps playing a video game over and over again, then that's an addiction. I'm like, yeah. no. But when you look at what I think is lacking in the world today is problem solvers. Esports in any game is about solving problems. The first time you played like, you know, Super Smash Bros, or you're trying to be like, you know, like go rescue Princess. Uh, oh God, no, I totally forgot. Princess Peach. Know, Princess Peach, right? You didn't quit the first time you fell in a pit, right? You're like, I'm gonna go back and do that again. And then it's it it's it's training your brain to actually how to overcome obstacles. And that brain training, it's the same thing. Kids will ask me all the time, why do I have to take calculus? You're training your brain. Like if you can actually solve a problem in multiple ways, then when you're given a problem, your brain automatically will start to develop a way to solve the problem because that's what you've trained it to do. Your brain's a muscle. It's, it's, I don't care if whatever you're doing, you're using it and you're training it in a way that you want to do it to achieve your goals. So if we can start to use, you know, esports to start using it for the resources that it's at, I don't know, that's going to go off another tangent, but. No, I, tangents are, t- tangents are perfectly fine here. We do a lot of tangents. Well, it's funny. I, I was at the, um, one of the cool parts about Rochester, New York, is we have the, um, the Strong Museum, which also has the Hall of Fame for gaming. And I was oh, invited. What, what's it called again? It's the it's the Strong Museum and the National Strong, Nash- strong like okay. strong, okay, um, and that's where they have the video game Hall of Fame. Oh, so, yeah, I know, right? It's not just Billy Mitchell. In my backyard, right? So I get invited to the induction of um, this is two years ago. Minecraft was just inducted this year, so I got we actually created um, the Strong Museum in Minecraft because of COVID. They couldn't open it up, but let's go back. We're back, and I'm at the the in, inauguration, and they inaugurated um, the game Solitaire. And I'm listening, and I'm like, uh, that that's the game that they put on every computer just so people had something to do when they were bored at work. And then they told me why, and it was to teach everybody how to use the mouse. And I was like, oh, my God, why did really? I not know that? Really? 
Exactly. Is that not the most, like when that did, it was like, I was like, it was like my aha moment of like, the reason solitaire is on every computer was to teach you how to use the mouse for point and clicking in a game that everybody knew how to use. You know, yeah, that, that makes total sense. Now, yeah. now what's Minesweeper for though? I have no idea. I didn't, I didn't research that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, my, my uh, middle child, she's 14 and she is a Minesweeper junkie. She is that, that if there is a game, I, I'm sure that there's a competition around Minesweeper and I'm sure she would, uh, you know, be down for that. It, it, you know, and it, I just uh, popped up a uh, strong national museum of play, uh, yep. museum of org. If you want to check that out and that'll be in the show notes here. Um, that I, I now have another reason to go up to Northern uh, uh, upstate New York, other than Tim Hortons. I think you're in, I think you're in T-Ho's country up there. We, so. we are, it's in yeah. competition with Starbucks, but it, it was really funny when you actually mentioned that, like how, what a coincidence that the you know, National Esports Association and the National Hall of Fame for, um, for gaming is here. And we actually just did a tour and they took me downstairs into their basement. And Andrew, who runs, who's a curator of the museum, mm-hmm. you want to know a guy who knows way too much about video gaming before it was even a thing. Mm-hmm. And when we built um, the Strong Museum in Minecraft and started to really develop what this actually means, it takes takes things outside the box. And I was even talking with Andrew about like virtually we can do whatever we want in Minecraft. And I'm like, now you can get people to come virtually to your museum and visit your displays. And we built Mario Kart in the Strong Museum because Mario Kart was inducted. Mm-hmm. Um, and this year was Minecraft was um, was the number one winner. So it was pretty cool to be part of that um, induction into the Hall of Fame. So not that That's we went funny. off on a tangent, but... No, no, it's a perfect tangent. In fact, I pulled up some of the list of... Uh inducted games so we've got bejeweled centipede colossal cave adventure donkey kong doom final fantasy 7 oregon trail which if, if anybody is looking for some something hysterical to watch and you've might have missed it 10 years ago there's an oregon trail movie trailer on no. youtube oh yes i highly recommend the oregon trail the movie movie trailer i'm writing that one down if you were uh, if you were a child of the '80s, because you all played it on an Apple IIe in the library somewhere, and all you did was, you know, you know, uh, four oxen and six and whatever bullets sixteen hundred dollars will get me, because that's the way we played it. Nobody wanted to be the carpenter. Everybody wanted to be the banker. <laughs> so true. Yeah, it, it, all those jokes are in there, all of them, in the whole thing. It, it's a brilliant truck. But you know, what? Let, let's let's talk. Let's get off the tangent here for a second. But let's get back to the play part. National uh, uh, Esports Association, how does it differ? Like, again, this landscape is evolving and changing. And again, we got the the big name companies out there. To be frank, I will say that I didn't realize uh, I knew about you, but I didn't know about the NEA before uh, your keynote, to be honest. How does this differ than the other Groups. I mean, the other one are obviously for profit. You're a nonprofit company. Why make the decision? Let's do this. Why make the decision in this age when big dollars are getting thrown at esports and people are looking for that, you know, that magic, you know, way of doing things? Why focus on the nonprofit aspect as opposed to uh, another for profit esports company, if you will? I mean, I think that's a really easy answer for me is because it's, it's about the gamers. It, it has to do with who's protecting them who is actually working in their best interests and who's actually creating a pathway to success. It wasn't being done and not being in. And I took, I took things very personally in the aspect of, you know, I've mentioned my son, you Mm -hmm. know, when I watched what he was trying to do with his career and his pathway and going out there and I said, where is his pathway to success? Um, And it's, it's very important to me to really look at, not how do we get someone to be a pro esports player? How do we utilize this amazing tool to really help redefine the way that we're educating our youth? And how are we looking at classroom performance? And how are we looking at classroom engagement? And how can I, as as a leader, 
really help in that transformation of the classroom. Mm. It's not about how am I going to get, you know, the next, you know, kid who's going to win. Um, $3 million in a Fortnite competition, right? Exactly. And I don't mean to say anything bad, but what happened to that event this year? It didn't, it didn't show back up again. Um, because if we're only fixating on the money, the money is irrelevant to me. It's what these games can actually do and accomplish. And when someone comes in interviews with me and, and when anybody's coming into the workforce, I want to make sure that they have the tools that they need to succeed. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm actually working with the Rochester City School Districts here. And one of the things that they asked me, I said, just put me in the room because I want to motivate students to achieve their full potential. And in order to do that, I have to find out what makes them tick. And when you find out what makes the student tick and where their passions organically lie, it's amazing what they will do and they will follow you. And I'm like, we need more leaders like that. We need more students that take part of something bigger that's beyond the classroom and, and get them excited again. I don't, have you been, you're in education too, just like me, but everyone says online education is failing. How can that be? Because every student is addicted to their phone the problem why online education is failing is because you're using old school ways of teaching. I I am. uh, In fact, my program uh, that I oversee while the rest of my school district is mostly doing, you know, lecture six and a half hours a day. My program is different in that we are asynchronous. Do what you need to do. Here's the things you need to accomplish. Here's the teachers available for you. Our elementary program, we have our morning meetings, but then Teachers available all day for a one-on-one. And again, most of our kids are done within an hour and a half to two hours a day. And parents are really, at the start of this, were so confused. They said, is my child really getting enough? I'm like, yeah, your child is doing two solid hours of work as opposed to sitting around for four hours a day, you know, with the social, with, I'm not saying those things aren't important, but I get it. we, We have really looked at that, that, you know, trying to take this round peg and put it in a square hole, this whole seat time, this whole thing. That's a really important uh, point of all this is that, you know, when we're looking at esports, even, you know, that a lot of people are trying to take that round peg in a square hole and saying, again, it has to be this 12 week season and it has to be this and it has to, it doesn't have to be anything. Oh. In fact, you know, as you were talking about, where's the tournament this year? Where's the money this year? professional esports could evaporate tomorrow. That bubble could burst. In fact, I've talked to some people in business lately who are saying very clearly, guess what? The bubble is bursting. It's happening slowly because there's still COVID going on, but the bubble is bursting at the pro level. It doesn't matter for us. It doesn't at all. No, it doesn't. Especially if we build our programs with, as you were saying, meeting the kids where they are, building things specific for them, the game titles, everything doesn't have to be this one set mindset. Is that, is that what you're saying as well? Aim, th- that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm like, if you can create a successful esports program in a kindergarten classroom, it doesn't have to go beyond that. It doesn't. What you've just done is you're going to watch it evolve organically and let your students take it where they want it to go. Mm-hmm. And if you do that, that's what I've seen over the years is like they are powerful, intelligent, motivated individuals who have their own ideas. And all we are as educators, we should just be planting seeds. That's it. And mm-hmm. let them decide. It might be enough just to have, you know, your own program in your own classroom. It might be that you want to actually compete with your local school. It mm-hmm. might be that you want to get to a national title. But if we don't start with grassroots locally and we don't have that infrastructure, you can't look at how are you going to become the national champion because there isn't a national championship 
if you don't have the pathways to actually get to a national championship, if you're not creating an infrastructure so that you can compete on an equal playing field, so that you know that if you're 10, you're playing against 10 year olds, and if you're 16, you're playing against 16 year olds, and that there's this whole hierarchy of where you're actually leveling up at. You know, that's one of the things that, you know, it, if I look at where I, le- I see the National Esports Association in three to five years, or that's gonna even, be my next question, so yeah. go ahead. Perfect tangent. So, I mean, that's it. If once the infrastructure starts to be completed, right, and I can actually help start from kindergarten through 12 with a program that actually, I was going to say, just like every other sport, so that students know where their path goes. So you're going to start, I always say, if you watch a child playing Minecraft, I always go back to that because it's the easiest transferable to education, if you're a kindergartner playing Minecraft, your whole theory is seek and destroy. That's all you're going to do, <laughs> right? So you're going to blow up everything. That, that's your goal. Like that's that's easy to do. It's much easier to destroy than to build. But then what you start doing is you start watching. And then you actually will start seeing what other people are doing. So then you might, oh, maybe I'm actually going to build myself a house now. Now when somebody blows up your house, you take it personally. Mm-hmm. So now you're learning. It probably wasn't a good idea to blow up my friend Sarah's house. That was kind of mean of me. But then you're working together. And then also now you're like, can I help you build? And then you're working with other people. So you're, you're mastering your skills along the way. Um, but then what you actually said is, in the meantime, you're building community. But you might not always want to play Minecraft. Maybe you start jumping over to some other game that you possibly like. Mm-hmm. Um, and you all know, if we're into esports, I mean, League of Legends, heck, that's where to play than chess, in my opinion. Like, you really have to be very strategic. you got to have a pretty darn high IQ to actually master that game. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you can take a game like Mario Kart. Still fun to play. I always say easy to start, hard to master, right? Oh, it is brutally hard to master. Like we, and then you can even go to Sims Racing. Um, I was before COVID. I was over um, in London and talking with the guys at Formula One and watching what they're now doing with Formula One racers and training them using esports mm-hmm. and using the game and floored like what they're actually done and what actually I think Formula One did during COVID. And Julian, who's running the program over there, brilliant. Um, love what he's doing. And I'm like, I got to sit literally in a McLaren that had an Xbox in it and race. Like who gets to even drive a McLaren? I would never trust myself to drive a real McLaren. And I'm sitting in London driving a McLaren thinking I'm in a race. Um, I didn't do too well, by the way. Just (laughs) But It's amazing you say that even uh, about 25, 30 years ago, my father was training to be a pilot for United. And uh, I remember going with him down to San Carlos Airport and they had the 707 simulators there and it was on hydraulics and everything. And, you know, people just go, oh, you're sitting on a McLaren with an Xbox, big whoop. You could sit in your living room and do the same thing. But there is you know, when, you, when we start when we start taking ourselves seriously, when we start doing this seriously, when we start realizing that the intrinsic motivation around the power of this when we take it seriously, we'll transform students. I think that is a really, you know, on top of community, if I'm taking anything away from this conversation is the reinforcement of the importance of the community, the reinforcement of it doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. And again, we have to take ourselves seriously. And it is great to see that the NEA is there to, um, I guess, help others see just the beauty and the power of this when we do take it seriously. I think is that is, is that where, I guess, NEA kind of grows in its niche versus the other companies that are, again, I know we're not trying to follow and yeah. you're going to do whatever you're going to do anyway, but is that what really you feel separates you guys from everybody I think it puts us in a pack of our own. You know, okay. it, it's it's super important to me um, and it's always what's driven me um, and being ahead of an organization really helping to establish something that is new. We, we kid that this is like the new frontier, like, Mm. and everybody, it's funny when you even mention about money, like it's like this, you're mining for gold, but I feel like, you know, the, 
once you get to the vein, it's there's enough gold for everybody. And I'm like, if we all work together and utilize the resources that are out there, like we all win. And I'm like, and I have a different definition of winning than a lot of other people in my industry. Um, Cause my definition of winning is creating, as I said, that pathway to success so that when my students and people who have gone through our programs or worked with us, get out there into the wor- workforce, like, we want to create the Stephen Jobs of the world. We want to create the um, Elon Musks, the people who are pushing the envelope that are, are creating change. And then that also goes back to what are we doing in the educational market right now? Um, and how are we actually changing the way that we are educating and creating our future leaders of tomorrow and, and giving every student the ability to achieve their, I was going to say, like their inner dreams. Um, and I, I just did another, you know what I mean? We don't recognize that enough. Yeah, we don't. Nobody ever asks. I have a question that I ask every student is, uh, and actually every, my kids hate it. Like I'll go in a taxi cab. I'm like, what's the dream? Like everybody has a different, uh, a different skill set. And I also look for everybody's superpowers. Like, yeah, okay, you can tell me you're like, you know, like, James, you said you, you taught fifth grade. I'm like, I want to know your superpower. Like, what do you do better? And what do you do naturally better than anybody else on the planet Earth? When you wake up in the morning, it's the first thing you want to do. Like, when you find a child's superpower and you find it young enough and you inspire that, like, it's amazing what you can actually create. Um, I'll go off on one tangent because I'll, I'll tell you. So... I asked my, my daughter, you know, what she wanted to be when she grew up and she said a butterfly. And I thought this was a really brilliant analogy, right? Like you start out in a cocoon and then you bloom and you become a butterfly. Sure. It's beautiful. And I asked my son and he said, what's ever easiest. And again, I'm like, that's so freaking brilliant for a five-year-old because as five, what's ever easiest to you is not what's easiest to the other person. Right. It's what you naturally gravitate towards. And when everybody says, if you follow your passion, the money will come. If we start looking at where your students passion naturally gravitates towards, and we just keep pouring water on that seed and giving it sunshine, that's where like, magic happens. And every day I tell people like, that's what I want to do is I just want to like, I want to help you find your magic. I want to help it grow in ways that you never even thought about. And I tell students all the time, tell me what your ridiculous dream is. Like without, if you could do anything you want on the planet earth without any obstacles in your way. And I'm like, and then let's create the pathway that's going to get you there. And most people, not even students, no one's ever asked them that question. And it stumps adults. I want to, I want to uh, be a chef on the West coast of Ireland, just so that's out there. So Galway. I uh, love it. <laughs> and, and, and I will, I will say that uh, having that as a dream, I am working on it. But um, you know, the other thing I think not again, to dig even further into the tangent, but you're, you're, I think we're playing off of each other right now. We might just have to go for a few hours here. <laughs> the, the, the thing I, I hear too, or I don't hear a lot of high school kids, especially don't feel they have permission mm-hmm. to do any of these things. The question I, a similar question that I ask kids, what is your brand? Oh yeah. If, if you are going to market yourself right now, Got what it. is your brand? You know, how are you presenting yourself to the online world? How are what what is it? What does it look like? How are you acting? How are you behaving? How do you want people to see you? And, you know, because we don't talk about entrepreneurship and marketing. You know, it's amazing. Those stories of we have a, we have a child in our school district. His name's Alex. And he uh, he started a company called build a bow and he started it. I think it was in sixth or seventh grade when he started it with his mother and it's actually grown. He's, I think he's gone on Oprah and all kinds of stuff, but for that's the, Oh yeah. Build a bow. But that is the exception to the rule. Yes. And that's because you had a parent who asked him the question, right? What, you know, what is your brand or what do you want to do? Or as you're saying, what is your passion? What do you want to be able to do? Again, most of our kids, you, you say, 
you ask them that question and they look at you like, well, can I? Or what? how do I do that? Or what do I do? They don't, you know, we talk to them about social media, yep. right? And it's the most, I tell people, it's the most inauthentic conversation that you can have with a teenager is try to teach them about social media. Because, you know, we have to check those boxes. Like, did you do your digital citizenship training? Yes, we did digital citizenship training. Check the box. But when we talk to them about social media, to them, it is just the dumbest conversation they've ever heard in their life because they're always three steps ahead of us sometimes. Um, or they think it, they're three steps ahead of us. Right. <laughs> or we think they're the experts when sometimes they may know of the things, but they don't know how to navigate the things effectively. But if the conversation is, what is your brand? How are you presenting yourself? What avenues are you taking to do this? Now this becomes a real conversation where you are not the dummy who's trying to talk to these kids. You're, you're saying, I have something to offer you. You have something, a skill that you are doing. Let's put these things together and let's work together on this. It's a totally different conversation to have. And I think it's one that, as, as I'm hearing you say, the NEA is an organization that's working to help with those conversations beyond your brand, well, but again, finding passions. Well, I think it, it's it's really funny because everyone thinks it's only about esports. It's only about becoming a pro athlete. I'm like, you have to understand they're so esports is just a doorway. Like mm-hmm. when you walk through it, um, what do you want to do with it? Where do right. you see this leading you? You know, especially when we, 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 even if we circle back to what we said earlier about students that are playing games diligently way too many hours. If you start asking the student, okay, what do you want to get out of this? What, like, what, what's the next step? It's like mm-hmm. they kind of have an aha moment like a parent does. It's like, well, uh, I'm just having fun. Okay, totally appreciate that. Fun's a great thing. But when... Is it enough? And what is it that you want to do? But then you start to like, kind of like manipulate all the other little things that they're doing. Like, are you streaming? You know, what's your Twitch channel look like? What is you, and it goes back to what you said, what's your brand? Like also like, have you started to think about other areas that you can do? What is your expertise? Like, okay, you got that done. What's the next thing that you're going to do? Mm-hmm. So then it's not just, it, it, it has to be play with a purpose. I mean, it has to be. Um, it drives students crazy and when I first start talking to them about it. But I'm like, if you want to be successful and after school and you want to, everyone's like, I can't wait to move out of my house, my parents' house when I'm 18. <laughs> How many times you heard that, right? I'm going to move out. Not much anymore because it's too expensive. Oh, no, but they still want to do it. And then also sure. they have a reality check, right? And I'm like, it's right. not that easy, right? But I'm like, okay, let's talk about it. Like, let's set up that plan. And they're like, they're like, you know, well, Mrs. Bajoric, like, how did you do this? How did you do that? And I'm like, thanks for asking. And I'm like, now let's break it down. Mm-hmm. Like, let's yeah. just break it down. It's, it doesn't matter what you want in life. If you don't have, you have to have direction. You have to have a plan. It even like, <laughs> I know it sounds silly, but we're going to talk about business plans during esports. Like, no matter what you do, you have to understand your budget, uh, your limitations, and your expectations. Um, and once you set that up, then you're going to understand how you're going to get what you want. Like, maybe you wanted to get a PS5, which, I guess, right now is almost impossible. <laughs> but you know, I don't know how people are finding them, but okay. Yeah. Like even I've talked with Sony, I'm like, okay, can we get one? Yeah, they're they're crazy, but okay, you want that. Well, how are you going to get there? Mm-hmm. So if you want to save up enough money, like, do you have a job? Like, if you don't have a job, maybe you're you're streaming on Twitch. Do you? I, what is your income stream? Because if you don't have an income, I'm sorry, like yeah. you're not going to go very far in life. Um, and there's only so long that you know. That's why we go back to people saying. Esports people uh, only eat cheese pups and, and are in their parents' basements. And I have a running joke. Some of them are in the attic, but, you know. <laughs> That's where we're putting my son. Uh, <laughs> actually re- re- redoing one of our attics uh, here now. Uh, Lori, this has been a very... I think we'll just call this episode the episode of tangents uh, <laughs> because that's I think we went off on several of them. But all of it, I think, incredibly valuable. All of it, I think, requires uh, people who are listening to this to maybe take a step back and take stock in where they are at and with how they are thinking about their esports programs. 
if people want to learn more about the uh, National Esports Association, learn more about you, where best to reach out, connect with you or your organization? I mean, you definitely see you put put our little uh, uh, Twitter thing on the bottom there, but That's also Esports NEA, NEA right? Yep. Yeah. And then NEA.gg and, you know, follow me on LinkedIn um, and just reach out. What I tell everyone is like the amazing thing, and even I tell students is like, reach out, ask a question, what can we do to help and support? I mean, that's what we're here for. Um, and if I can't, you know, if I'm not directly accessible, I have plenty of people that I can put you in, in touch with um, and just make something happen. Um, if you don't ask, you're not going to get anything. So, and I was actually just having that conversation with my daughter. I said, you know what, ask the question and let someone say no. But if you don't ask, you don't know if someone's going to say yes. Right. And um, I really have this motto. There is no the, the word no doesn't exist at the National Esports Association. And if any of my staff says no, they see me get very upset. <laughs> yes is the answer. And like, let's make it happen. Um, you know, we've got a long way to go um, with esports and creating that infrastructure and in esports and education. But it starts, you know, within an it starts locally, as I said, and you have to think globally and whatever I can do to help and support that. That's what we're here for. Well, Lori Bajoric, the president of the National Esports Association, thank you for being a guest on the Academy of Esports podcast today. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for all you do. That will do it for this week on the Academy of Esports. I've been your host, James O'Hagan. Esports are organized competitive video games, allowing schools to redefine their athletic culture, diversify opportunities for student participation, promote good physical and mental health, increase collegiate scholarship pathways, and play games. We can never forget the importance of play. The mission of the Academy of Esports is to support these ideals. The vision of the Academy of Esports is for all students to experience the fun and joy of playing competitive video games. You may follow me on Twitter at Jim O'Hagan. That's at J-I-M-O-H-A-G-A-N and through the Academy of Esports account at TAO Esports. It's a great way to get the latest blog posts, podcast episodes, and news coming out of esports and education. And remember, you can continue your engagement by going to www.taoesports.com. You can also connect through Facebook at www.facebook.com slash T-A-O Esports. Thanks again for listening, and I look forward to our time again next week.